Yes, uh, good afternoon uh, everybody. Uh, welcome here to, uh, to family, uh, colleagues, uh, friends, uh, interested uh, parties uh, in this, uh, this afternoon. I'm Thomas Klei, I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Science and Engineering. I'm uh, the pro-rector this afternoon. That means that I'm uh, replacing our rector, who also sends her uh, congratulations, uh, Pamela Bibovic, and uh, I will uh, yeah, guide you to this afternoon. It's uh, my pleasure uh, to do that, uh, uh, to chair this academic session in which uh, Professor Nava Tinterev, our chair in Explainable Artificial Intelligence, will hold her inaugural lecture. Uh, she became our chair in, uh, in 2020, and uh, yeah, with, uh, in the period of COVID when things were closed and, uh, and we all had to do things online, we briefly met in the online setting a very short around that time and happily we are now uh, slowly catching up with uh, all the people who started in this fast growing faculty and uh, uh, can celebrate again uh, such an important moment uh, today uh, uh, with you. Let me take an, a, a short moment at uh, the first minute to explain uh, uh, to you, uh, as the audience, so that's the, the, the boom this afternoon, uh, why it is uh, uh, such a great moment. Uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, with the founding of our new faculty, uh, that's uh, 2018, the Faculty of Science and Engineering, uh, uh, we claimed a position in the Netherlands as a science engineering faculty, and we were able to join all kinds of discussion. Uh, yeah, gremia, you would say in Dutch, uh, people who sit on tables and divide money. And that was for us as a faculty also an, uh, a new thing. And there was a sector plan, Beta Technique, Science and Engineering uh, in the Netherlands developed in that time, and we were able to join in that sector plan. And for the first time for, for Maastricht University, we actually got an, uh, a sizable sum of money for a couple of areas, which uh, allowed us to hire a number of positions. And uh, for, uh, uh, at that moment, still uh, uh, DKI, uh, now the Department of uh, uh, Ducks, uh, this led to uh, two new chairs uh, we could appoint, and also a number of, uh, of other positions. And one of those uh, new chairs is, uh, is talking here, uh, here today, because it's a little bit like soccer, huh? when you go out uh, and have a new position, you go scout around, and uh, uh, I have uh, here to apologize to, uh, to my, uh, my colleague from Delft, where, uh, where we scouted and uh, <laughs> found, and uh, we found uh, incredible talent in Delft, and uh, yeah, said, yeah, that would really fit with the ambition of this faculty, with the uh, vision we had for growth, for the teams uh, uh, of the department, that would make an, a great chair in uh, explainable AI at our, uh, at our place. So, yeah, here you are and uh, you, uh, you came to Maastricht. I understand uh, from your CV that you really are a world citizen. Eh? I don't have to spell out your CV because everybody sitting here, I assume, knows you. That's why they are sitting here. But if you look at the different places, uh, studied in Sweden, PhD in Scotland, uh, uh, traveled to uh, Australia for internships and, and, and more places, uh, uh, yeah, a, a world traveler, a world citizen. So it's not surprising that you actually end up here in the Euro region. Eh? The border of Belgium is uh, 20 minutes uh, away from here. Uh, biking. Uh, the border to uh, Germany uh, is 20 minutes by car from here. So this is really the heart of Europe. So for somebody who supposedly also has have been told to me speaks all those languages of all those countries and even more, uh, this is the place to be. So very nice that you uh, traded in uh, 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 your previous place and, uh, and became our, uh, our professor here in the, in the region. Of course, uh, you are not uh, here today to listen to the life story, but you are curious uh, about what, what she is doing her, or in other words, uh, what, uh, what do the NAVA eigenlijk uh, uh, when you uh, uh, Google her? And the answer is uh, possible online. I think we'll get the answer probably a little bit uh, uh, today uh, here too. Uh, but uh, yes, you are an amazing researcher. You fit really well in the landscape which develops here in in the south in Maastricht, but also in the Dutch uh, in the Dutch setting. Huh? There is uh, more and more interest in AI uh, locally here, and uh, also on uh, our campus, uh, Brighton campus in Heerlen, at, at different places. Uh, you are not only uh, yeah a, a research leader but also uh, socially engaged. You, uh, you won a prize for that, uh, the most socially responsible innovation in Delft, and you are uh, the chair of the Social Sciences and Humanities Committee in a uh, big uh, uh, artificial intelligence program funded by a national government. So really a well-rounded researcher, fundamental research, uh, socially engaged, and 
Yeah, I also understand that you are one of the nicest person in this department. There are lots of people sitting here. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and I have been told by colleagues uh, that you even are the nicest person because you are the only person who ever sent a thank you card, a physical thank you card, after uh, a meeting uh, to, uh, to the department back. And uh, nobody else uh, has actually done that. And that uh, uh, puts you in the spot of, uh, of, of the nicest uh, person here, always around to help people always willing to listen people so uh, yeah we are very very excited having such a great personal board in our faculty i think i do not have to uh, explain uh, more to you all here uh, audience it's time to give the floor to uh, professor tinteref for an inaugural lecture with the title whom are you explaining to and why professor tinteref the floor is yours Thomas uh, Dean Clay, thank you for the very lovely introduction. Uh, it's a delight to see so many um, familiar faces today. I think I've, I've missed many of you during COVID and also many of you who are joining online, I suspect just as many as we have in the room today. So no talk is complete without disclaimers. So I'll start with those. All errors herein are my own, which means not, that no chat GPT or other la large language model was used in this talk or heard. Now, my remit is inexplainable AI, but I don't claim to work in all of artificial intelligence. I work in a sub area that looks at artificial advice giving. A consequence is this, that the majority of my work has looked at supporting people and end users in particular in their decision making. Doesn't mean I've exclusively worked with end users, but certainly that has been my focus. Those of you that have lived in the Netherlands have probably seen headlines like these over the last couple of years. And this reflects among others, the fact that we're using all kinds of algorithms to support us in decision making. This is the kinder Kinderzuslagen affair. We might also know this as the child benefit scandal in the Netherlands, for those of you that maybe haven't been here or are not familiar with it. This was ruled as a human rights violation. It resulted in rather large fines, but perhaps more critically, we had people in this country who had to pay back welfare and they didn't know why. They didn't know why and they couldn't do anything to actually change the decision. So it's good that this has been recognized, but I'm afraid to say this isn't an isolated incident. We also have, for example, in Amsterdam, lists that mark people as potentially at risk of committing crime. These are well-intentioned. Huh? The idea here is that we find people who are potentially going to commit crimes and offer them remedial care offer them education, offer them support. But what do you think happens to the children that are actually now on this list? What do you think happens to their families? Right? Despite the best intentions, these children have no way to actually get taken off these lists. And we would like to say that the kind of algorithms that we used in the welfare scandal are no longer in use, but there are newspaper headlines almost every day finding instances, if not the same algorithm, similar algorithms still out there. Would we then conclude that AI is evil? No, AI in my view is not evil. I actually would welcome our new AI <clears throat> overlords, uh, collaborators, right? However, I do think that a lot of the time the systems that we have look like humans, and sometimes they look like robots in the sense that they are embodied as people, but they might also seem human-like because they use natural language. This can lead to assumptions for most of people, thinking that they have intelligence that they don't actually possess. Or we might think they have intents. Oh, it's an evil AI, it wants to manipulate us. It has no such intent, it is not a human. It has a very different kind of reasoning. However, 
Artificial intelligence and machine learning do make mistakes. The predictions made can be incorrect. And in assuming sometimes that these systems are flawless or omnipotent, we might forget that these mistakes occur. And you'll find that this is a bit of a reoccurring theme in this talk. My view is artificial intelligence should be seen as a tool, neither good nor bad, merely a powerful tool with which we have to think responsibly and carefully when we use it. Incidentally, mistakes. Do you know who else makes them? We do. I'll come back to that too. In the Netherlands, we have a very big proposal uh, called hybrid intelligence. It's a Svartekracht proposal. Those of you that know the formats, lots of universities, lots of PhD students. But the underlying thought behind this is that we augment human capacity. Now, in order to make better our human intelligence, we, to some extent, have to understand what's going behind the screen, what the computer is thinking. No, not thinking, but how it is reasoning. And the person also somehow needs to communicate back. Right? So there has to be commu communication between the computer and the person and between the person and the computer. Now, I actually don't like this image in particular because, again, the computer is made into human form. In my world, hybrid intelligence looks more like this. Now, I'd want to go back to the Tuschlachen affair, the welfare scandal, but before that, I'll give you a rather simplified view of the kind of machine learning pipelines we often have in these kind of systems. We have different kinds of data coming in. This data gets fed into a model, and there are many different models that we could use, and I'm not going to pick a particular one for the purpose of this talk. And then it makes a prediction. For example, this person committed benefit fraud should be flagged, or this person did not commit benefit fraud. Now, the predictions and the outcomes could be very different for different prediction models, but I've just made it as simple as I could as a schematic. Out of that, you will probably have an explanation model resulting in some kind of information that helps the person to make a decision. Right, so this is a very common pipeline that we see in the systems. Not the only one, but a very common one. What do I think went wrong? So I love showing this comic to students because I think it exemplifies what we see, unfortunately, not just in student projects, but actually in a lot of industrial projects. People feed in a whole bunch of data, they turn things around, they change parameters, they work with different models, and they say, right, this was the result I was looking for. But what is this result that they're actually looking for? What does it mean for it to look right? Well, we look at performance. Now, this in of itself is not wrong, because what we're saying is we want this model to be as right as possible for as many people as possible. But let's think back to the welfare scandal. Let's say your system is right 99% of the time, but is applied for a million people or families. Your error rate, 1%, still affects 10,000 people. So you still have to think about how this is going to be used. How is it going to be applied at the end of the day? And when you make a mistake, what can these people do to actually correct it? Right? So the first problem here, in my view, is that we're overemphasizing the importance of accuracy, often at the cost of other aspects of the model design. It also means that aspects such as explanations are considered late. Think back on the pipeline I showed you. Explanations were shown at the end. And this is often also in terms of time. People first design the model and say, oh, shoot, we need to be able to explain this. And what happens? Well, the explanations are not all that good, right? If at all. The consequence in many cases is that these explanations are not human understandable or not as understandable as they could be. This happens in all sectors of life, and it happens in high-risk domains. The issue of understandability is crucial, so it's not just enough to generate an explanation. Right? There's recent legislation on the Euro European level saying we should be able to explain. But here's the issue that we now have with current predictive models. In this case, 
with the Dutch police. Recent study found that the interpretation and filtering of the outputs was just too complicated for the police to understand. So what happened? Well, they set up a whole different intelligence unit that was busy with the interpretation. So this intelligence unit actually had to translate the output of the AI and to actual concrete actions that the police understood. Now, luckily, we do have people generating explanations. We're going from incredibly complex models to these kind of things. You probably don't see it now, but you'll have to take my word for it that this is quite a simplification of what's going and is reasonably understandable in comparison. But despite the fact that we've made progress on generating these explanations, can we really say that they're understandable? And can we say that they're understandable for any end user in any context? Far from. We often hear the word explanation, but we also often talk about interpretation, interpretability. And this is different. Now, explanation has to do with the fact that we are generating these explanations, explainability. There's something that we can do to somewhat move it forward. But interpretability looks at the human in the loop. And there are several definitions, and now there are probably as many definitions as people working in explainable AI. But here are a couple. The degree to which a human can understand the cause of a decision. Now, it's actually incredibly difficult in computer science terms because causality is something we can rarely identify, but we can at least identify plausible correlations. The degree to which a human can consistently predict the model's result. Now, you can see that both of these are actually looking at the output of the model, the predictive yes or no. Can a human predict for a new instance whether, for example, a loan would be granted? the extent to which a model or the prediction are human understandable. So some notions of explanation look actually at explaining a full model and not just the output of it. Before we continue, well, how did I end up here? And I mean this, of course, figuratively, right? But this is the, the city of Maastricht, and hopefully you've seen a little bit of the sunshine that's coming out now. Well, I actually started in this place the city of Uppsala, and it does look a bit like this this time of year, very white. And here I studied computer science, and it was a very theoretical form of computer science, uh, compiler theory, automatas, these kind of things. Um, but at some point I realized that if I was going to work with computers, I also had to think about the people that were using them. How was I going to make the software that I was building genuinely useful for people? And I decided that I was going to study psychology. I wasn't going to do something half-half. I was going to do computer science properly, and I was going to do psychology and cognitive psychology properly. And then I went to this place. This is Australia. So I studied a year of psychology at the University of Wollongong. Worlds apart, perhaps, both geographically and conceptually. That said, this has informed the way my research has gone ever since. I identify as someone who is, on the one hand, in human-computer interaction, and on the other hand, in artificial intelligence. And there's actually an intersection here. This intersection is internationally recognized and has a community that is called Intelligent User Interfaces. Now, when I first started, this was in my PhD, this wasn't a commonly accepted view that you could combine psychology and computer science. And I was incredibly lucky that there were some people that were willing to take a chance on me. It started with Ehud Ryder, actually, in my master's thesis, who brought me to the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, and later Judith Mastoff as my PhD advisor. Now, at that point in time, I was not looking at particularly risky domains like the welfare scandal, right? It would be a bit, uh, yeah, well, risky to give it to a PhD student as a problem, potentially. So I looked at a slightly lower risk domain of recommend recommendation systems, recommender systems, like the one you see here in the figure. Right, so we have a book by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Why is this book being recommended to me? as a user, right? And the user wonders why this is a good book. And I, as a PhD student, was wondering, 
well, what makes this a good explanation? And what does actually good mean in this context? And if you look at commercial systems we have today, these are the kind of explanations we also see. I'll let you decide for yourself why you think this is good or bad. Here's another potential explanation. I'm asking for music, and the system tells me, actually, given your face, no music. Is this good or bad? Well, I would argue this, argu this explanation is not fully transparent. It doesn't tell me everything about how the system works. It also is not actually giving me a recommendation of music. Early in my career, people told me that you cannot have an explanation if you're not recommending something. Actually, I would argue that a good recommender system also knows when not to recommend something. And this comic is drawn to, for me, actually, by a colleague at TU Delft when I described my work, and I was very happy that they were able to capture these rather subtle nuances. So this kind of explanation, I would hope you agree, is rather useful from a human perspective. And this is sometimes called a justification. So this is a plausible reason, but it is not necessarily fully transparent or a high fidelity one. Which brings me to the question of why do we want to explain? Right? And this is a beautiful picture of the gray city, granite, silver city of Aberdeen. When I first started my PhD in 2006, that's a while ago now, uh, the first thing I did, as many PhD students do, was do a literature survey. So what did people actually want their explanations to do? And this is the summary of what I found at the time. You see that these are rather different from each other, and there are quite a few. So my first conclusion was there's no consensus about what makes a good explanation. People have very different opinions. Let me talk you through a few of them. Transparency, we hear this more often. This is about explaining how the system works. It's the kind of question the person might have, how was this recommendation made? This can be rather different from decision support or effectiveness. Why this item, which could equally be why not this item? Back to the music example. Or it could be persuasive. In commercial systems, such as recommender systems, we might really want to push users towards a certain consumption. Why must you buy this item? And we hear of other criteria, such as trust, increasing people's confidence in the system, scrutability, sometimes known as recourse, so allowing people to tell the system it's wrong and to correct it, satisfaction. In recommendation systems, we want people to come back and enjoy using the system maybe not so much in medical decision support, who knows, and efficiency. In some cases, it might be important that people can make decisions fairly quickly. And so during the course of my research, I came increasingly to see that it's really important to know the end goal of explanations. I saw over time that you could have explanations that are transparent, but actually don't allow for recourse. You know why the system did a thing, but as a user, there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. The system might be effective. It helps people make good decisions, like the justifications, but they're not particularly transparent. You don't know the inner workings of the system. You can have explanations that people like. Oh, they're very happy with the system, and when they fill out their surveys, you're getting top scores. But when they're making decisions, they're not all that good. And I'd like to give you an example of that that was also during my PhD. Satisfying but not effective. So what I was doing here was looking at the benefit of personalized explanations. These explanations were automatically generated. It is fairly simple, but they were automatically generated, and they were, in some cases, personalized, in some cases, not. And what we found consistently, multiple experiments, different setups, different domains, we still found that personalized explanations were the worst for decision support. People made worse decisions when the explanations were tailored to them. Oh, but people liked them. Huh? So it's really important to think about what you're measuring. So luckily, I learned that fairly early in my career. Let me move you forward in time. Let's look at transparency as a purpose. 
and in the domain of disputed topics. Let's also look at our pipeline again. So here our data is a bunch of search results, and these search results are coming in response to a query. The query is intellectual property rights, pros and cons. The model for each search result tries to predict whether it is in favor, against, or neutral. Here I've put pro, con, and neutral. And we can generate an explanation, a visualization of why it is classified in this way. This work has been led by Tim Draws. He did, he's sitting right there. He did this as part of his internship with IBM. And here, right, the task is predicting the stance for debated topics. In our data, we wanted actually to make sure that we had examples that were both correct and incorrect. And we had state-of-the-art prediction models and state-of-the-art explanation models. The task, and now this is the task of the person, was can you guess the prediction? So what do you think the system predicted the search result as? Now we could have asked, is this result pro, con, con and neutral? But hopefully you're realizing the problem with this is that people of course have prior knowledge, prior opinions, prior preferences, and they will apply this to making the decision of the classification. So the question here is, what do you think the system predicted? That is, is the explanation enough information to guess the system prediction? And since some of the results are incorrect, we are really asking about the system prediction rather than what the people think it might be. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, depending on which classification model you have, your quality of prediction will differ. So you can affect the accuracy of the prediction. Well, we know this, right? But what is also interesting is that there is an interaction effect between the quality of the explanations and the model. That is, certain combinations of model and explanation work better. In fact, very simple classification models with coefficients, those of you that work in machine learning, uh, were particularly effective. Uh, and certain combinations of very complicated classifiers together with certain explanation models worked very poorly. Again, when we're talking about goodness here, we're talking about how understandable the explanation is for a person. So this is potentially a focus on transparency, perhaps effectiveness if you like, but there is no scrutability. There's nothing that people can say, well, actually, I disagree that this is a neutral result. I think it's a pro result. I'd like to change it, right? There's nothing that you can tell the system, this is why I think it's incorrectly classified. When I talk about explanations, or if I read papers about explanations, almost every introduction says, explanations help us gain trust. Is that really a good thing? Imagine the navigation systems that we have in autonomous vehicles. If we trust those blindly, where does that take us? Is there such a thing as too much trust? Perhaps there's a notion of appropriate trust. So sometimes we should question systems, and sometimes we should rely on them. And is there a difference between different explanations in terms of how much they elicit appropriate trust? Now, this was also something I started to look at in my PhD, which was how you present the explanations actually really matters. And you don't need to take it from me. This is something that in the recommender systems domain has been acknowledged for a while. So as early as 2010, there was a keynote from Francisco J. Martin, who was at Strands. And his experience was working with commercial systems. And he was saying already then that the largest focus, 50% of our focus, in terms of commercial success, should be looking at the user interface, not necessarily at the algorithms. Now, we're not saying that the algorithms are, are not important or the analytics are not important. We're merely saying that the focus should definitely include user interfaces. I'd like to also give you an example from my own experience. This is work led by Matt Smulder, who was actually a master's student at TU Delft at the time, together with Juan and Anel and our collaborator at Blendl. Those of you that don't know Blendl, this is a news aggregator, so they have all kinds of news sources. 
and they try to combine them in a way that provides a diverse news diet. Right, and this is a screenshot from what, what their web page might look like. Matt, Soana, and Jasper, together with me, concocted a very complicated method for creating viewpoint diverse articles. So we're trying to improve the diverse provision of news. And our question was, does this improve the consumption? Do people read more articles? The question was no, which actually was not a bad thing. There was no significant difference in the amount of reading. So the diversification also didn't harm what people were reading. But what did matter was the number of hearts and whether there was a thumbnail. Now, I should be cautious here because what is correlation and what is causation? Maybe articles that are better written also are more popular. Yeah. But nevertheless, this again raised the question, to which extent might the interface matter? So back to trust as a purpose. In this case, we had a study looking at stocks. Now, stocks are interesting because they contain a certain amount of uncertainty. Uncertainty in the model, uncertainty for people. And the decision the person can make is, I would like to sell the stock, it's likely to go down, or actually it's going to hold steady or improve, I would like to hold it. And we looked at three different ways of explaining them. I won't go into this in detail, but we built on three different logical ways of reasoning. Inductive reasoning, abductive reasoning, and deductive reasoning. This work was led by Federico Cao, who's sitting here now with us at University of Maastricht, but he was actually doing his PhD at Cagliari under the supervision of David Espano, and Hannah was also collaborating with us on this work. So we compared these different explanation styles, and we were wondering, do some of these lead to people agreeing more with the system, right? If you trust the system, you would think that the predictions it gives you are correct. These are the explanations that led to the largest level of agreement. These explanations are inductive reasoning, which means that they use examples, previous examples that are similar or dissimilar that help inform the decision. Now, in case you think it's a domain-specific thing, I can assure you it's not the domain or the type of data. We were able to find this result for other data sets as well. Now, if the system was right, the human was also right a lot of the time, right? If the system is right, the human trusts the prediction, then the human is as right as the system, right? But if the system was wrong, Unfortunately, because they also still relied on the system, the human was wrong for a fairly large percentage of the time, 75%. So they also agree when the system is wrong. So I hope I uh, can convince you that there is such a thing as too much trust, too much reliance for certain styles of explanations, some more than others. That was the first part of the talk, so this is the why, right? But it also is important who you're explaining to. If you're explaining something to Homer, maybe there's a donut in the explanation or you won't have his attention. If you're explaining something to Lisa, you can probably use fairly complicated concepts and she'll get it quickly. And so th by this, I want to illustrate that the explanations are contextual in nature. You need to think about the who and the when, effectively. Right? And for this, I often use the framework of Bart Kananenberg and others. Uh, it's a framework used in the recommender systems domain that we use in terms of user experience. And this is actually divided into user perceptions, user experience, and user interactions. But the point I want to make here is that both personal characteristics and situational characteristics influence users' quality of interaction with the system. In terms of situational characteristics, my team and I have looked at quite some different ones. Uh, I'll come back to explaining the unexpected. Um, more recently, we've also had a group uh, looking at group explanations. So Shabnam Najafian graduated last month and Francesco Barilla is continuing this line of research where we've been looking at explanations for stakeholders which are similar to each other. So for example, people who are traveling in a group. And we've also looked at the trade-offs between privacy and disclosure. 
So transparency versus privacy. And which factors in the group situation might influence the information that is valuable to disclose. Building on this line of work, we started thinking about what happens if we have different kinds of stakeholders that we want to explain to, so not ones that are similar to each other. Human resources is a good example of this. So an explanation that you give to a prospective job seeker will be different from the kind of explanation that you generate for the employer, different again from the recruiter who sits between them. And this line of work is being continued by Rowan. Right, I said I'd talk about explaining the unexpected. And I also said at some point that AI isn't the only instance or intelligence making mistakes. Humans also make mistakes. How many of you have experienced this or have friends that you think do this? Now, when we search for information online, there are actually quite a few cognitive errors that we make. A common one is confirmation bias, and this is the one that's depicted in this picture. It's our tendency to consume information that agrees with our views and actively ignore information that disconfirms our views. Now, it's very nice to say that all these people that we talk about with Facebook, on Facebook, have this confirmation bias, but I'm sorry to say there is not a person in this room who doesn't suffer from it, me included, right? And so if we want to present people with viewpoints or articles that are different from the current viewpoint, in a sense, they are unexpected. I started thinking about this roughly five years ago, and coming from a recommender systems background, I looked at at it also from a recommender systems angle. Here we have a profile of a user, and these are the movies that they've uh, watched. What I'm depicting here is effectively blind spots. So these are the movies that the person has not seen compared to other users. So the, the active user's profile is conveyed with dark gray, and the light gray conveys other users. So the user can see which kind of movies are underrepresented in their profile compared to others. I was happy to see that people were able to understand what these explanations mean, and it also led to a greater intent to explore movies different from the movies that they'd seen in the past. Oh, movies are well and good, huh? but uh, that's not gonna solve any societal problems, right? So we also looked at that for news and we visualized people's news reading profiles in a similar way. How many articles have people read on certain topics, and which other topics that are related have they not read about? Again, people were more likely to read articles that they didn't know about yet. This line of research is being now followed up by Lisa Rigger, who is also sitting with us in the audience. But she's looking at it specifically in the context of search. What she wants to do is to reduce clicks on results that confirm the previously or currently held opinion of a user. At least initially, I think we, we have goals beyond that. And we looked at this kind of intervention. So here we have a targeted warning. The search result might reinforce your opinion. So look, select another search result if you want to minimize the risk of confirmation bias. This is already effective. Note that there's also a button that they have to click on to see the results. By adding this button, we further reduce clicks on these attitude confirming results, right? So the warning is effective, but the warning combined with the button is even more effective. But there's already a problem here. We did this for results that were attitude confirming. Yes, that worked. But we also put it on random search results. Still works. Not so great because this has a potential manipulation. What if we start to put warning labels and hide the results, or at least make it harder to get access to results that people should be reading? So we've been inspired by the work that people have done on the concept of boosting. This is effectively a form of teaching people about their metacognitive abilities and about what's happening with the search results. This preserves user autonomy and has the perspective to actually lead to more lasting, enduring effects. 
Now, when people are dealing with search results, they don't have time to watch an educational video. So we don't have that much time to influence them or teach them, right? But what we do have is the possibility to look at repeated interactions. So what we've done is we've set up a mock search interface for disputed topics. And in this, we can put lightweight interventions that are tested over time. The first experiment for this is already running. And I'm very excited to see where this round of research takes us in the years to come. So these were some contextual characteristics, but we've also looked at individual differences or individual characteristics. I particularly want to highlight the work that we did with the PhD candidate Yu Ching Jin. At the time, he was at KU Leuven under the supervision of Katrine and myself. And we looked at these kind of interactive interfaces. We looked at particular in terms of working memory, visual working memory, and expertise. Now, here I'm talking about domain expertise, not machine learning expertise. Hopefully, most of you looking at this explanation interface think, OK, it's kind of complex. And you'd be right that people who score higher on the music sophistication index, a correlate of expertise in the domain, are getting more out of it. And by getting more, I mean discovering more diverse music. That said, we also looked at, do they accept the recommendations that they get? And do they perceive that they have to make a larger mental effort, a larger cognitive load? And the answer is no. Even at higher levels compl of complexity of this interface, the acceptance and the cognitive load is not higher for people who are not expert. We also find that these kind of interfaces increase the level of interaction and the accuracy of the resulting recommendations. So despite the relative com complexity of these interfaces, they do show a lot of promise. And I would say that because they're interactive, people quickly learn the relationship between the different parameters that they see. Now, we talked a lot about different studies today. I don't expect you to remember all of it. But there are a couple things, if I could choose, that I would want you to remember. Understanding is potentially a necessary, but it is not a sufficient condition. That is, it's good that we can help people explain, understand what's going on in these systems with explanations, but that is the only the beginning. We need to also help people make good decisions. AI is not evil, it is not omnipotent, it is merely a tool. Therefore, distrusting the outputs of these systems is only healthy. Finally, human-centered artificial intelligence broadly, but explainable artificial intelligence more narrowly, benefits from questioning our underlying assumptions. I have been so incredibly fortunate to have colleagues who have been part of this journey of questioning the assumptions. And these have not been all computer scientists. I've worked with psychologists, social scientists, communication scientists. Thank you all for the depth that we've been able to explore in the work. And I'm also happy to say that in the long-term program that has now just started, we have a lot of colleagues outside computer science that will make sure that we ask the critical questions that we do need to ask to make sure that the systems that we develop are genuinely trustworthy. I don't say this to be humble or to belittle the efforts that it's taken to come here before you today, but I am fortunate and I do recognize the role of circumstance and luck that has brought me here. I also want to recognize the people who have supported me and believed in me in ways big and small. I mean, of course, opening doors academically, sometimes even when I haven't seen it, uh, but also outside the ivory tower, people who have lent me no small measure of moral fortitude. I hope that I, in turn, continue to be there for the people who have been entrusted into my care. Now, there are many smart people in this world. There are also a lot of nice, 
people in this world, but the ones that I think are truly exceptional are the kind ones. Ik heb gesproken. Thank you uh, very much for this uh, this interesting presentation. I think we uh, all will uh, tonight, uh, uh, when I question my uh, Alexa to suggest me some music, I will ask why she actually uh, uh, suggested that uh, that to me tonight. So it's a, a very, uh, very interesting talk. I uh, enjoyed it very much. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for, uh, for being here with us, and especially, of course, uh, uh, the person giving uh, the nice talk today. Also, uh, I think there are people online, so thank you for being online with us. Uh, this brings us to the end uh, end of this afternoon, and uh, for the online people, that's that's really the end. But happily for us, there is still uh, uh, a reception afterwards. So may I ask everybody to uh, uh, follow? Huh? We, we we go out uh, out first, and then you can follow uh, to to the rafter. So the the old part of the monastery where drinks are being served and please all don't stand in a long line huh? you are with quite a few of them so if you also go stand in line then it takes you several hours uh, before it's your turn to say hi and i have been told that uh, nava eki will walk around and will find you and that's a much more efficient way to uh, to say hi and uh, and congratulate you so once more thank you all uh, for coming here and uh, with that i uh, i close this academic session thank you very much <laughs>